Welcome good people, my name is Joel Collier and today we're going to talk about should I correlate error terms in my sim model. So this is a, a question I get quite a bit um, is I, I'm looking at my confirmatory factor analysis and the modification indices uh, kind of tell me that two error terms want to correlate with one another and should I did it, do it, is it acceptable? So we're going to talk today, today about is it acceptable to do it? Are there certain situations where it's not acceptable? And why, in essence, am I uh, getting these indications that really say that they need to even be correlated? So I've got a simple uh, kind of uh, model here for us to kind of discuss today. This was uh, from some research we did on self-service technology, uh, specifically kiosks, and we were looking at consumers' attitudes towards these um, self-service technologies and then we had two kind of influential factors on that attitude one was location convenience so how convenient was the SST located uh, and then also perceived risk of uh, information theft in essence you know through this and so um, it was the kind of perceived risk so we have three unobservable constructs and they were measured by four uh, measurables uh, for each one of those trying to assess uh, consumers uh, attitude. So initially we had just kind of set up a uh, simple CFA right here uh, and had kind of run the analysis and we had, uh, initially saw that this data was somewhat kind of problematic when we kind of first ran it. Uh, mostly because of a potential correlated errors then. So let's just kind of jump into the results here of this simple CFA and we'll talk about you know why we saw these potential for correlating errors to kind of help our model. So initially we looked at the estimates and, and you know from that uh, estimate screen we can see that our CR values stands for critical ratio or our T values were all well over uh, 2 and our standardized regression estimates too all of them were over 0.7 so initially we thought well everything's really loading pretty strong and good so we're we're good to go. And then we looked at the model fit, and then we saw all kind of problems. Um, the relative chi-square fit here is not good. 6.58 for relative chi-square, that's kind of high for where it should be. Our goodness of fit indices were okay. They're all above 0.95 for the most part. But then when we kind of look at our badness of fit indices, our root mean square error of approximation, um, it's not great. We got a 0.09. Um, so while our items seem to load significantly on their unobserved construct, the model fit as a whole wasn't great then. So next we looked at our kind of modification indices. And what these modification indices do is saying that if you constrain your model through these correlations, uh, will it increase your model fit by decreasing chi-square? So these values right here is saying if we increase this correlation uh, or I inputted this correlation in your model, this would decrease your chi-square amount by this amount right here. Um, so the question is, is, well, how big does that modification indice need to be to really see model fit kind of, you know, increase substantially? Well, you know, in a chi-square difference test, one degree of freedom difference um, of 3.84 is about a 0.05 significance but I'll tell you right now anything with a 3.84 modification indices won't change your model fit at all um, a good you kind of rule of thumb is really probably needs to be greater than 10 for you to seek any kind of change in uh, model fit with the modification indices and the reason why that is is because if you're looking at like uh, a change of 10 through chi-square is about the equivalent with one degree of freedom is probably the equivalent of about a 0.001 difference. Um, so just because it's over 10 that doesn't necessarily mean as well that I'm going to correlate an error term. It just means it's probably uh, eligible for really seeing a significant difference in, in model, model fit too. So if we initially look at this, we look at this error term between E11 and 12, well that's, that's pretty high with 32. Uh, that's out there and then if we look down there we see some other ones and then we see a real huge one uh, with E3 and E4 118 and we said a difference of 10 
is a significance at a 0 0.001 level. Well, this is 118, so this is large. So let's go back to our model. <clears throat> so this is initially saying that if we correlate the error term between E3 and E4, we're going to see a difference in chi-square of 118 for that one degree of uh, that we're kind of giving up by adding that correlation. Well, what would cause this? Um, you know, the, the biggest reason you're going to see kind of modification indices and usually large modification indices uh, of correlated errors within constructs. So these are with, you know, within this location convenience construct. The biggest reason usually is there's a lot of overlap between those two uh, items. So between location convenience three and location convenience four, those items were pretty much asking the exact same thing. Uh, there wasn't much difference between them. The respondents didn't respond very differently to those. And in essence, um, probably not much discrimination between even those two items in trying to capture something different of the, of the unobserved construct. It's pretty much asking the same question. And what happens statistically is right now, all of these error terms and location convenience were initially being treated as independents. Like E1 was not dependent on E2, E2 was not dependent on, they were all treating them independently of one another. But what the modification indice is saying is that if you correlate E3 and E4, instead of treating these independently, I can explain the invariance um, that's taking place between 3 and 4 uh, kind of together. Uh, so in essence what happens right now is the reason why you're seeing this huge modification indice is because E3 is being treated independently of E4 and it's kind of saying, hey, I've got all this unexplained error variance out here, but if I try to explain both of those kind of together instead of independently, then I can explain a lot of that variance away. And the reason why that is is because, again, those items probably have a ton of overlap and so the same error for E3, you know, is that same error for E4 because they're just very similar to one another. Um, and so you notice that I only correlated just one of these. Now we had this other one uh, initially between uh, E11 and E12, which was in the 30 range, but I don't want to correlate multiple error terms to start with. Um, I think really your best way to kind of handle this is just to kind of stair step it down really because what you'll find out if you start correlating multiple ones at the same time it causes trouble and sometimes it's even unnecessary this one with e3 and e4 was really large so let's just start with that one and kind of run our analysis and see if it really even helped uh, for our model fit so if we go back into our estimates Everything's still really significant. No kind of issues with standardized regression weights. So still no problems there. But let's go into model fit. All right, so our relative chi-square dropped quite a bit uh, on this one. Our goodness of fit indices are high. The, all of those are really, really good. But what about our badness of fit? All right, we're at 0.07. So we're still pretty close to having good fit, you know, across the board at this point. Um, but still a little problematic in some areas, and most likely it's probably because of that E11 one, that modification indice that we saw that was really high. So let's go back to modification indices. So with E11 and E12, we still got you know a modification indice of you know 32. That's that's really large. Uh, that's out there. It looks like E11's got some of this overlap with uh, E92. But no huge ones out here like that 118. But let's go back and, you know, um, look at E11 and E12 then. So this is saying between it, within the construct of SST attitudes, E11 and E12 has a pretty strong modification indices that their error terms are very correlated to one another. Uh, if we correlate those errors and we run our analysis again, let's see uh, if we've got all that we need to do from a uh, model fit perspective. Still looking at the estimates, still, you know, highly significant, no real problems still out here, real high standardized regression weights. Let's go into model fit. All right, so model fit now, our relative chi-square is, is a three, so now that's an acceptable range for 
uh, relative uh, chi-square value. Our goodness of fit indices are all really good, but let's look at that badness of fit. Okay, we're in the 0.05 range now. So could we keep going and try to get our model fit even more, better and better and better? We could, but there's probably no need for it, right? We're only correlating error terms, not because we had problems with our estimates or something loading. It was just because our model fit was kind of problematic. And so at this point, we're really kind of done. I don't really need to really add more and more uh, correlated errors because my model fits good right now. Doing more so's just, you know, basically... Um, adding more correlations but not really seeing any more difference and now you can see we lost all those kind of 30s and 20s uh, of those modification indices do we still have some that's a little high out there yeah that e7 and e8 is you know a little high um, you'll also see too that with these e like e1 for instance it says e1 would uh, change your chi-square value of 13 if you actually correlated it with attitude itself. So it's suggesting that we actually correlate E1 with attitude. I'll tell you, that is an impermissible correlation uh, that takes place. You cannot correlate an error term of a measurement item with a completely uh, different construct that's unobservable. That's impermissible. Uh, to do that. Uh, the other one too that we saw out there with uh, E1 was it was talking about E1 and E9 well it would increase by 7 if we did that but if you look E1 and E9 is error terms of really two different constructs so this is um, the error of E1 which is location convenience and this is E9, which is attitude, SST attitudes. And that's an impermissible correlation of errors as well. The only uh, acceptable correlation of error terms are ones that take place within construct. They cannot be across construct or even across constructs to unobservables. You're really only talking about... Um, correlating error terms within construct that is actually acceptable to do so. Well, what if I have, you know, for instance, if it was E11 and I've got multiple ones that it's asking me to correlate within the construct then, uh, is that acceptable to do? Well, one, you've probably got a lot of overlap um, with those constructs or two if you're seeing a lot of modification indices that are really high not only within but maybe even across you may have what's called a methods bias too which means you have an artificial correlation between constructs simply because of the method that you were using to collect the data um, and there's a lot of tests that you can go to test to see if that's there. It's just common method bias, um, you know, from that perspective. But that may be one of the bigger reasons why you're seeing so many modification indices, not only within and across, that are very strong, is you may have a methods bias. Now, in the past, you would see some people, um, kind of, the, I would say, the old school purist that would say, never correlate uh, error terms. I really feel like that's way too restrictive. Um, I, I think you're going to see in very large models too with numerous measurement items that sometimes um, you're going to ask a lot of repetitive items too. So these only had like four, but sometimes you're going to ask like seven, eight measurement items for one unobservable construct. And some of those are going to have some you know, repetitiveness to it. Uh, and the idea of you treating them all independently is just going just to inflate your unexplained error when in reality you've got two constructs that are just, I mean, two measurement items that are just really close to one another. And if you correlated those error terms within that construct, uh, it, you know, explains a lot of this variance that's there. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the, uh, the long and the short of it. So just to kind of recap, can I correlate error terms within construct 
yes you can um, I would not go crazy about with doing that again you're only doing that usually because of there's model fit issues um, if you've got a bunch within construct you may even have a method variance can I correlate constructs measurement items across constructs no that's in that's impermissible. Uh, well, can I correlate, you know, error terms with unobservable constructs? No, that's impermissible uh, as well. So I hope that kind of um, helps explain, you know, correlating error terms, why we do it, um, why it's acceptable. And if you're looking for more information about correlating error terms or just citations that you use, you know, from this video, I'd encourage you to check out my book, Applied Structural Equation Modeling Using Amos. Uh, it's at most major bookstores. Uh, I've got a link down in the description. Um, and as always, if you saw value in this video, I'd ask that you like and subscribe for more videos to come. Uh, I hope you all have a great week. Good people.